This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Good afternoon, and welcome to another episode of Pacific Partnerships in Education. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, here on Think Tech Hawaii. Thanks for joining us today. We're going to be talking, as we usually do, about uh, education issues and Pacific uh, sort of ones that impact the Pacific. Uh, today's talk is not going to be quite so specifically Pacific, <laughs> not specifically Pacific, uh, a little broader. It's going to be on the subject of evaluation. And to help me out here, I have uh, uh, Ms. Sonia Evanson. Uh, welcome, Sonia. She's joining us via uh, Zoom meeting here. Welcome. Thank you, Ethan. Sonia is an evaluator at Pacific Resources for Education Learning, a colleague of mine, and has been there for quite a number of years, done a wide range of evaluation projects, both with Prell and, and as well as with other groups uh, around and across the Pacific, has bounced all over the Pacific doing evaluation work out in the islands, has done a lot here on, on Oahu. Uh, so uh, a very broadly experienced evaluator. So um, let's just, just jump into this. Talk a little bit, if, if you would, Sonia, about sort of what you see sort of is, is the, the, the central issue in evaluation. You know, what, what is evaluation all about? Thank you, Ethan. So to start with evaluation, the, there are many definitions of it, but oftentimes it's to judge the value or worth of something. But a more updated definition would be collecting data to um, show or to make important decisions about something. So depending on why you're evaluating something, you collect different types of information to decide whether to continue a program or to change direction of a program. You're going to find out what's working well, what's not working well. And in general, you have two different avenues of evaluation. You have formative, which tells you how you can improve your program as you go. And summative is pretty much the story when all is said and done, and you need to talk about the impact of your program. So depending on the use of it, you get um, tasked to find out these different things along different avenues. Sure. And some people add in a, a, an even earlier phase, right, the front-end evaluation to, to establish the need or the uh, sort of the context of a problem, right? Right. You start with what is a problem, and a needs assessment would tell you what the problem is, and then you um, address the problem. And evaluation is often done um, un underway of the project or at the end of the project. And like you and I were discussing earlier, oftentimes in the past, the evaluator would come in as the cold card observer and tell you how you did without involving any of the clients or stakeholders, it would be kind of like doing the consumer report on a vehicle, like this is what works, this is what doesn't work, and not get involved with the many facets of the program. But now there are many different types of evaluations, often called participatory evaluation, where you get involved with the staff and you participate or you see different aspects and you get different opinions from different stakeholders as you go. Right, and it, and it makes sense. Uh, the, the the earlier form that you spoke of is more. Uh, there's not much to do at the end. If if your evaluator says, "Hey, you did this well, you didn't do that well," it, it's sort of well, the project's over and it's done with, and, and that, you know we, we may have learned, and perhaps next time if we do this again, we can make the use of that. But it doesn't really, in no sense, does it inform the ongoing project, right? And, and further, it's. Uh, it has sort of that bad connotation of evaluation as being this very negative thing, right? Evaluation is sort of grading a project or assigning blame for what's gone wrong on a project or uh, putting responsibility on certain people for certain parts of a project. Uh, all this with these sort of loaded aspects, right, which make evaluation sometimes people get very nervous when they hear, oh, we're going to be evaluated, right? We, we see. Hey. Say that because my professor at Claremont, Stuart Donaldson, um, wrote many articles about the fear of evaluation. And it's right, nobody likes to be judged for anything or nobody likes to be told they've done something wrong. They like to be told what they're good at, but they don't necessarily want to be told, oh, this isn't wrong or you didn't meet this or 
So it, it's taken a bad, um, it has a bad reputation mm -hmm. sometimes. Um, one of the things before we get into that story, I want to talk a little bit about one of the hardest parts about being an evaluator is people's misunderstanding of when it happens. Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes I've gotten hired at the very end of a project to come in and tell the story of the project. And the project's already happened, and I haven't had a chance to collect relevant data while it's happening or set up anything. So if nothing else happens out of this show today, I would hope that people would understand that you involve an evaluator very early on, even in the planning phase of the project, so that you can get involved at the right points and collect data that's meaningful and have a conversation with the clients about what is meaningful to you, but set it up ahead of time so that you collect that valuable data when you can. Exactly. This is what you mean by uh, being an intelligent consumer of evaluation, is to uh, bring that evaluator on well before your project starts so they can help you frame that project and, and figure out what do you really want to know? How, what are you, what's your real central questions, right? What do you want to see different at the end of this work than, in, than is the case right now? And how will you know that, it, that it's different, right? And those, are our, right. those are core questions that can't, you can't come in at the end and start addressing them very effectively at all. But, but if you start right. you know, months before the project actually starts, you can really have deep, rich conversations about what, what the real central issue is that they want to change and how they'll know that change has happened, right? Right. And one of the important things I like to start a conversation with is why do you want an evaluation? And oftentimes it's mandated by a funder right. and people are like, oh, it's something we have to have and it's kind of painful like going to the dentist, <laughs> not quite as painful as that, but not quite desirable. But I often have a conversation of, so can we use this for something? Can we use this for you? So not just a report that sits on a shelf because somebody required it and you just went through all this exercise of, you know, troubling the staff to collect data that doesn't feel like it's connected to anything. So really it's about having a conversation with people about what is most meaningful to you right at this time. And part of that story is how new is this project? Because if it's a brand new project just getting off the ground, you're going to ask a different type of questions than you have a mature project that's been around 10, 20 years that's really kind of settled in their processes and how they do things, and you can expect a different type of result. So you really have to custom make your evaluation approach depending on how new the project is or what phase the project is in. And also, a lot depends on context, mm -hmm. which brings us to the Pacific. <laughs> yeah, before we jump into that, let me just sort of, the, then you, you've made an interesting parallel. It almost sounds like you've you view evaluation as almost a, a sort of a coaching process, right? That is, you, you go out, if you want to improve your physical fitness, you go out and you find a coach who can help you determine what muscle groups you want to build up, uh, what you want to change, maybe your posture, your, your body language. They work with you. They help you identify the specific exercises you'll do. They encourage you. And this is much more the kind of process you're talking about. An, an evaluator works very closely with the project people. So they can, as you put it earlier, really do the best, be the best they are, right? And they can do things well, as well as they know how to do, and even perhaps better than they knew they could do them, right? Rather than being chastised after doing them not quite so well, they can actually, because of the formative nature and the front end work, they can actually do them better, right? Right. And the very act of asking very pointed questions, like, well, how do you believe that by doing this, this is going to happen. It really helps people hopefully streamline what they do because I have seen many projects do way too much stuff. And if you are really clear about your objectives and then we talk about how to measure those objectives and have conversations about this should lead to that, it helps people to kind of really think through what their program is. And I really want to help people to make life easier, not harder, and not do so many things all over the place. Really focus in on 
um, what it is you're actually doing. And I'm going to take a little sidetrack just to tell you the story of why I became an evaluator. Sure. I was a program director before, and I had an evaluator that asked me these pointed questions. And because of his questioning, I was like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? What am I doing in this program? And it made me rethink my program, but it also made me very curious about the field of evaluation, which is why I'm an evaluator today, because it was a whole new way of thinking that I appreciated. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's really good. And of course it should be, evaluation really should be a win-win kind of situation, right? When you're, when you're providing a more or less objective sort of external advice to somebody, you're watching the, the program get underway, you're watching the processes they're using, you're watching how they're implementing what they said they would do, and you can step in and say, I see you're, you know, you're talking to these people in 20 minute segments. I wonder if you'd do better talking to them in hour long segments or whatever. You know, I, I see you're asking them for written feedback. Maybe this group would do better giving you oral feedback. Um, you, you can help them really address their issues in ways they perhaps as program people aren't gonna see, they're too close in, right? Right, right. And you set up your kind of questions ahead of time. You know, you ask them what the program is, and then you look at what data points are going to tell you. And of course, getting that data in early on time to do something about it is, is the key. Mm -hmm. And the other part about collecting data, and another one of the pitfalls I've fallen into is collecting too much data. <laughs> and, and that kills you. I mean, what am I going to do with all of this? I, my, my bottom line is don't ask it if you're not going to use it. So you really don't want a million questions, and especially with surveys, people don't answer surveys. I mean, if you get more than 10 questions, if you get pages and pages, people lose interest, and then you don't even get honest responses sometimes. Yeah, yeah, it, it's it is it's a very uh, and it's very very sort of context dependent as you as you noted there. Uh, some, if you're talking to groups, for instance, of college students who are in class when they take the surveys, you may you may get a fairly good rate of response. If they're already in class, they can respond on their mobile devices. It, it may work quite well. If you're trying to survey groups of people out in remote islands in Micronesia. You know, they're not going to be reached online particularly very easily. Uh, even if you give them handwritten, you know, um, um, hard copy surveys, it's going to take a while for them to fill them out. They, they may not get returned right away. Uh, you're, uh, yeah, it's a very, very different, different game. So uh, you do want to be very careful, certainly, because the, the whole point, as you say, is to help make the project run well, help get it, keep it focused so the work of the project is directed towards and is accomplishing the objectives of the project and not just sort of keeping people busy doing lots of stuff that may not be helping them, you know? So what we were talking about just now is methodology, like what method of getting information is going to give us the best information? And that too is kind of an artistry. I mean, there's like different types of methods that tell you different things and sometimes you want to get from several different data sources, like maybe you talk to parents and students and an outside observer about how the student is doing. So you get three different viewpoints. It's called triangulating, where you try to get to the truth of the matter. That's one of the methodologies. Mm -hmm. But other methods other than surveys are focus groups and talking to people, interviews, observations, and there's many different tools that we have in our toolkit to get at information, it, all with pros and cons. Exactly. And we're going we're gonna, to, in our second part of the show, we're going to explore some of those tools a little, little more closely and talk a little more in-depth about some evaluation work that you've done and that actually you and I have done together. But right now we're going to take a brief break here. Uh, we have about one minute uh, off, and then we'll be back. Sonia Evanson is, will help us explore the area of evaluation a little more. Hi, I'm Lisa Kimura. I'm the host of Family Affairs on Think Tech Hawaii. Join us every Tuesday at 11 a.m. to talk about the issues that really matter. Everything from policies that need to be changed in Hawaii to the fact that we need better gender equality so that we can all have a better shot. Again, join us every Tuesday at 11 on Think Tech Hawaii for Family Affairs. Aloha. 
and aloha. My name is Calvin Griffin, the host of Hawaii in Uniform. And every Friday at 11 o'clock here on Think Tech Hawaii, we bring you the latest in what's happening within the military community. And we also invite all your response to things that's happening here. For those of you who haven't seen the program before, again, we invite your participation. We're here to give information, not disinformation. And we always enjoy response from the public. But join us here, Hawaii in uniform, Fridays, 11 a.m., here on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. And you're back here on Lake of on, on Pacific Partnerships in Education here on Think Tech Hawaii uh, with me, Ethan Allen, your host. And joining us uh, via Zoom meeting today is uh, Sonia Evanson, an evaluator from Pacific Resources for Education and Learning. We're talking about evaluation. Uh, in the first part of the show, we discussed some of the rationale for evaluation. We, we made the, I hope, the strong point that evaluation should be done early, that it's not a negative sort of thing, it's a very positive thing. If done well, it can lead to better programs, it can lead to sort of wins for everyone, your, your funder, your, your program people. Um, and we we're just starting at the, at, as we went to, to break to talk a little bit about sort of some of the approaches, the methodologies, uh, the way of doing evaluation. And we had talked a bit about surveys, but Sonia, you, you were saying there are, other, there are other approaches to use when surveys aren't necessarily the way to do it. Right. Right. So not everybody, and especially out in the Pacific, the paper pencil surveys, you're dealing with not only whether or not they um, literacy is there, but it, it's a different language. And then things get lost in translation. So there are many reasons why surveys might not work, um, other than the fact that people don't like to respond to surveys. People do like to talk, though. Mm -hmm. um, and so answering questions, um, either a one-on-one -on -one interview or in a group interview seems to be a way to get inter inf information out of people, but it's a little more time-consuming. It takes you know more resources to do it, but then people can talk freely and bounce ideas off each other, and you learn much more rich information about a project than you would get out of a survey. Plus, it gives you the time to ask other questions that besides what you thought you were going to ask in the survey, you can ask probing questions to ask what they really meant. Yeah. Oh. So, no, I mean, I, I understand that that's valuable. But, you know, as you say, the downside is it takes a lot more time, a lot more effort. Uh, but yes, uh, I've certainly found in my work uh, out in the Pacific Islands, getting people to respond to surveys was very hard. But there are even subtleties, of course, to interviews, right? Different cultures are, uh, have these different attitudes, right? And, and Pacific Island cultures, talking about yourself is not particularly considered um, something that, that is done, particularly by certain uh, subsets of, of Pacific Islanders, right? Right, and then, so for example, in the Marshall Islands, a woman can't necessarily ask a man certain questions. So it has to be a male interviewer asking a man. Um, then there's some age differentials. I get away with a lot more because I'm not from there, so I don't fall under some of the rules. But I mean, there's a lot of different kind of cultural nuances that are good to know so that you don't um, offend anyone. Right. Um, yeah. And oftentimes, too, there's a reluctance to tell you anything um, negative, so you have to couch a question in a way that gets at the truth of the matter. So instead of saying, what didn't you like about this workshop, then you just say, um, what would make it even better? If you just have to kind of spin it to a little bit more positive, because people like to please. So that's a general rule. Right, there, there, is, there is a very common uh, phenomenon sometimes called the Pacific Island, yes, right, where, where people do not want to say no to you. They don't want to be in a con confrontational situation. And so they will say yes, even when they don't exactly mean it, and, and they, just to keep things very positive. And so as you say, if you ask them what was wrong, they, they of course, oh, nothing was wrong at all. And uh, right. yeah. And then there is these, the social interactions, if, you, if you're talking to a group, right, that is particularly, if, if you have an older relative, you as a younger relative are not particularly allowed to contradict that person, right? That's considered extremely rude and not done. 
So you have to think about the groupings if you have groups of people, and then you have to think if that's the right method. I want to tell you a little story about when I walked around doing interviews. It was actually for a project for you, Ethan. It was um, in Yap on an outer island trying to find out about um, water use practices mm -hmm. or did they clean their water filters. And so I went around the village and I was asking, do you clean your filter? And the answer was always yes. Do you treat your water? And they're like looking at me for a clue. Like, do you boil it? Yes. And then they're how long do you boil it? And they said, an hour. So they were, <laughs> they were looking to tell me the answer that I wanted to hear. And I'm like, oh, this isn't working out. So I realized I had to change tack and not use that approach and rather walk around the village and observe actual practices and go look at water filters myself to see if they clean them or go look at if they did treat their water, and even those who said they did, they did, they drank straight out of the catchment. So observation was my backup plan because the interview wasn't working. <laughs> right, you know, that, that's a good point. Sometimes you, you play on one thing like a survey, that doesn't work. You go to your backup, which is an interview, and that still doesn't work. So yeah, uh, it's always that bottom line. You, can, you go and observe the behavior yourself. But that, again, is, is even more time consuming, right? And, and uh, intensive, and there's certain things you, you're not going to get out of that. But you bring up a very good point that people uh, do like to make others happy in general, and they, they want to please you, so they're trying to guess what answer you want to hear, and they want to give you that answer. Uh, and that, of course, is not what you're after. You're after some sort of at least quasi-objective truth, right? Yeah, getting at truth is kind of the bottom line of evaluation. What is the truth or what is the actual real situation? So um, whether or not people are learning what's intended, sometimes you give them a real test or you ask them to rate themselves in what they've learned. The self-rating isn't quite as accurate as a true test of learning, but then true testing comes with a lot of faults as well. As we know, people are up in arms sometimes about does the SAT test actually measure people's ability? Um, so there's a lot of debate about appropriateness of tests. Mm -hmm. And then there's cultural appropriateness. If you have a test about tobogganing in the snow and you give it to somebody in Samoa, they don't even know what snow and tobogganing is. So is that appropriate to ask them those kinds of questions. Right. It's much, much more if you can look at the outcome that you wanted. So in, you, you mentioned earlier my Water for Life project. And one of the things we really wanted out of that was to know whether people's practices of dealing with their water were changing. And it was nice to be able to go back towards the end of that project and see many more places that had earlier had very non-functional rainwater catchment systems now had gone and they had clean roofs, they had clean gutters, they had first flush diverters in there they presumably were using. Uh, they had a good new tank or a newly clean tank uh, with perhaps a new hardware on it for, for the spigot and all. And they were actually apparently treating their water a little differently than they had before, uh, which was, again, sort of the bottom line. Did they, did they understand that they wanted, it was valuable to keep water clean and protected. So yeah, it's, it, it, you know, I wouldn't, I would have felt very bad and I wouldn't, it would not have been successful to go and give them some sort of a, uh, an actual test on, do you know this, do you know that, do you know the other thing about water? But the, the fact that I was seeing more people involved in, in monitoring the water and keeping their water systems clean in, the, in these communal systems, uh, and paying attention to the, the quality of the water and reporting data on the water, even uh, back to the EPA in, in many cases. These were all indicators that, that this project was being successful in terms of getting people to change their behavior in a, sort of in a, in a desired way towards, towards their use of water, right? Mm -hmm. And so we got, that, go ahead. Something that you said um, spurred a thought um, about buy-in to evaluation. So oftentimes you have a project and you have to collect this data because it's mandated by somebody in the staff or like going through the motions and not bought in. But the whole buy-in would 
more likely happen if the staff were involved in that conversation up front. Like, well, how do we know that these students are learning this thing? And if the design of the evaluation included their thought process and they understood, well, this is what our project is trying to do, we're trying to get them there, then hopefully they would buy into the data collection itself, because that's often one of the more painful pieces, the data collection um, and the time it takes to do that. And sometimes data accuracy is a problem, too. You collect data, but it's not necessarily accurate. I know it's hard enough to get just plain attendance counts um, for folks out in the Pacific region. It's just a really, it, it's not part of the, the thought process that this is important. But I think people need to know, if, why are we using this? It's important for what? And I often am like that myself. Like, I don't want to do something unless I know why. And then I buy into it, and then, like, then I'm more likely to willingly do it. Right, and, and the participatory aspect of the evaluation is really important, too, because the people on the ground, the, the, the sort of stakeholders, if you will, of your evaluation, often will have very good ideas about what is feasible, what is sensible, what's going what's to resonate with, with the people, with, who are actually doing the project, who are you know, uh, really involved in the day-to-day -day execution of it. And you may think it's very reasonable to ask them to observe their students and, and fill out a, a survey or a, a checklist on what students are doing. They may not think that's a sensible way to do it. They may want to, as you say, sit and, and talk story about that at the end of the week and say, hey, here's what went on this week. Here's I saw so-and-so doing this that showed me they have now learned how, how to you know, accomplish this task, right? And, and it's a very different idea. And ignoring your participants is a, a, you put a lot of project, the project goals at risk, I think. Right, right. But it does take time and it takes a lot of conversation and it takes a lot of reflection. But I love the idea of reflection because it just helps make your project stronger. But you do have to build a time for it. Don't yep. joke about that. I mean, it's just time consuming, but it can be very worth it. Yes, indeed. Hey, and speaking of time, we are, I'm told now that we are out of time. The project, uh, the, this project has come to an end. <laughs> I thank you for all your good insights, Sonia. That was, this was really, really uh, uh, informative for me and I'm sure for our audiences here. That uh, uh, Sonia Evanson here has been, been helping us explore evaluation. Thank you so much, Sonia. Good luck and we'll see you in on. And I hope you... And I hope you will come back and join us uh, in another couple of weeks for another episode of Pacific Partnerships in Education. Until then, I'm Ethan Allen signing off.